Malp is an Aboriginal word from the Western Desert of the Northern Territory and it means friends on the journey. And it was the word that my Aboriginal elder friends told me that's what we should call it because they felt that if we're going to seriously address the health problems that beset Aboriginal people in this country, that we've got to do it together. But importantly, we have to do it within an Aboriginal paradigm. And their way of getting good health before colonisation was that the traditional knowledge holders, the Nunkri out there, they would look for children who had the right outlook on life, the right attitude towards the, the rest of the tribe, and they would take them aside and they would start training them to be what we would think of as doctors. And that meant not just learning about, about physical medicines, bush medicines, but also learning about how to help people with their social and emotional well-being. And that's really important. The Nunkri, as it were, hold their people together. When we started Malpa, it was in Central Australia, and we did it in the Walpuri Town Camp. It's a pretty desperate place, let me tell you. And it, it emerged out of asking the elders there, why does nothing work? And they said, well, you need to do it our way, and you need to involve us. That's what we did. We did it their way, an adaptive version of that. And, and very much involved them in, in designing and delivering the, the project. And the project gives them, it gives the kids the, the, the opportunity to take real leadership roles in the community and to see themselves as responsible, not just for themselves, but in relationship to those around them. So these kids become real agents of change. And anyone who's ever had, has got a 10 year old or 12 year old child knows the children not only soak stuff up like a sponge, but they give it out, they can't keep it to themselves if they're excited about it. So that's why they're such powerful change agents. It's not a government program coming in and saying, you should eat this and you should exercise that, you should do that. This is them discovering how wonderful this is and just sharing naturally what they know. We did our first projects in Central Australia where all the kids were Aboriginal and then we were invited into Kempsey and the Dungari Elders Council said we really want the program but only on condition that you have non-Aboriginal kids too. And I struggled with that at first because I thought the major need is with the Aboriginal kids but we did it and I've got to say it's one of the best things we did because not only do we start building beautiful friendships between the kids and the non-Aboriginal kids start to get a respect for the old Aboriginal ways and are really impressed by it. But it had a, an unintended consequence and that was that the Indigenous parents and the non-Indigenous parents found that they were in conversation with each other. They started talking about what their kids were doing and they found a real bond was happening there. So it was really a very reconciling process and we're, we're delighted that that's now sort of part of the core of what we do. Look, it blows me away that we get such high school attendance. This is a struggle that government really, really has. And if kids aren't in school, they're simply not learning and they don't have a chance then to go on and earn, etc., etc. But on Malpa days, all the kids are there and they, they'll be queued up, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes before to start the session. But it's a real joy to me to hear stories from our leaders about what the kids do. Uh, there was one group up in Balbrook out of Kempsey, New South Wales, and uh, they were aware of the fact that lots of the, the, the kids at, at a certain stage were not coming to school. So of their own initiative, they asked around and they found out that the kids had nits. The parents didn't know what to do so they would shave the kids' heads. So they felt ashamed and weren't coming to school. The little young doctors, the Dalai doctors up there, then found out what can we do and they came up with a kind of a bush medicine which was a combination of traditional oils and modern oils. They got little bottles and they made up a fact sheet and they sent these home to the parents. So it was just a massage into the skull. And within about 10 days, all these other kids were back at school. I thought, this is such initiative. And then the kids the following week went to the principal and they said, some of the other kids have got little scaly bits around their eyes. What, what's, what's that all about? And it's just this idea that they can take control of things, that they can do stuff. They're not powerless, but they're really genuinely empowered. Well, we started with those 12 kids in the telegraph station at the Walbury camp in Alice Springs. 
Last year we trained 398 kids. This year it's somewhere between 700 and 1200, if according to what funding we can attract. And it's, it is growing exponentially like that. How do we do it? Um, sometimes I, I don't know how we do it, but certainly the support that we get, say, from SVA has been really pivotal us, for us in our growth as an organisation and also connecting us with people who want to invest in our work. I guess the thing I'm most proud of is that when the elders said to me, do it our way, they were so right in that judgement and being able to find something that worked for 60,000 years so well and find that by adapting it a little bit, it, it works so successfully in the 21st century, to me I think is something that is, is a piece of insight that I hope other people will tap into and find that in our, in our First Nations people, there's, there's so many things to be proud of uh, although there are so many problems to be addressed, but there are answers that work. We don't have to reinvent something, we just have to be wise and humble and listen closely to what's there for us to be told and, and then really wonderful things can happen.